have discussed about the different types of shallow foundation and then I have discussed about the two basic criteria of design of uh, foundation that is shear failure or bearing capacity criteria uh, and the settlement criteria and then uh, we have discussed about the bearing capacity criteria then what is the, the gross load, what is the gross pressure, then what is the ultimate bearing capacity, net ultimate bearing capacity, net safe bearing capacity then the gross safe bearing capacity, then the in terms of settlement criteria what is the safe bearing pressure and then uh, so finally, the allowable bearing pressure which is the maximum uh, net in intensity of loading that is coming uh, we can allow on a foundation in terms of bearing criteria and in terms of settlement criteria and minimum of these two will give me the allowable bearing pressure. So, now in the uh, today's class I will discuss about the modes of shear failure because we are talking about when you apply the uh, load on the foundation. So, there will be shear failure. So, there are different modes of shear failure. There are basically three modes of shear failure. They are the general shear failure, local shear failure and the punching shear failure. So, first one is the general shear failure. So, what is general shear failure? Now, this general shear failure can occur in dense sand or the stiff clay. So, I have given you the all the consistency chart for the clay and the sand. So, from here you can see that the, the stiff clay means if the Cu value undrained cohesion value is 50 to 100 kPa. So, if your Cu value is more than uh, 50 kPa and then you will expect uh, shear failure, uh, uh, general shear failure and if your consistency of uh, the sand it is in dense that means, 65 to 70 generally if it is greater than 70, uh, if it is greater than 70 percent then you can expect a general shear failure. So, now, oh, what are the uh, characteristics of general shear failure? So, if this is the, so when we apply a load, so there will be a, a failure and this there will be the, these are the failure line. So, this is the failure plane or the uh, sh shape of the soil. So, that means here if and this is the load, if I load the, apply the load on a uh, soil through the footing, if we measure the settlement, then we get a load but settlement curve. So, if I apply the load settlement will increase and then you will get a load versus settlement curve. Now, the characteristics of general shear failure is that here the failure, the OL defined failure surface. So, this is the failure surface that we are talking about these are OL defined. Then the bulging of the ground surface adjacent to the foundation will occur. So, that means the soil adjacent to the foundation because we are applying the load here the soil adjacent to the foundation they will bulge because it is the dense sand or stiff clay and then we will get a prominent peak in the load settlement curve. This is the prominent peak. So, that means we have this load increases then after the failure it indicates the soil has failed. So, after this failure it will decrease. So, that means we can have a prominent peak in the load settlement curve. So, the ultimate load can easily be located. So, this will be the ultimate load. So, this is the Q ultimate. So, this is the ultimate load that soil can take before the fail, before it fails in shear. So, that is why we can locate this ultimate load very easily. So, these are the characteristics of general shear failure. Now, what are the characteristics of local shear failure? So, this local shear failure this may happen for medium or relatively loose sand or medium and or relatively soft consistency clay. So, now, now here if you look at this failure and the load settlement curve. So, similar here this failure surface is well defined, but it is below the footing zone only because outside the footing zone this failure surface 
is not well defined. So, that means, the well defined OH or slip surface only beneath the footing, outside the footing it is not well defined and the, the, the bulging that will occur, uh, the, but that is not that uh, the significant amount as compared to the general shear failure. So, here bulging will occur, but that is a slight bulging will occur, but in case of general shear failure a significant amount of bulging will occur, but in the in the load settlement curve like the general shear failure here we do not have any prominent peak. So, because here load if you increase the load settlement will increase. So, there is not a very prominent peak. So, we cannot determine the ultimate load very easily. So, that means, the load settlement curve does not indicate ultimate load clearly. So, we cannot have there is a clear indication like the general shear failure what is the ultimate load and the significant compression of the soil directly beneath the footing. So, we have a significant compression of the soil directly beneath the footing. So, here these are the characteristics of the uh, local shear failure and then the question is how we will determine the load for in case of ultimate load in case of this type of load settlement curve because uh, there is there is uh, methods by which we can determine the load with this type of load settlement curve. So, that is called the single tangent method or the double tangent method. So, single tangent method means suppose we have if it is perfectly parallel to the settlement axis load settlement curve after certain settlement if it is parallel to the uh, settlement axis then we can draw a tangent over the last portion of the curve. So, we can get a q u and if it is not parallel still it is uh, increasing kind of thing then we can go for the double tangent method. We can draw a tangent on the initial state portion of the curve and uh, final state portion of the curve then the intersection point will give me the q u. So, there are two methods one is single tangent method the first one is the single tangent method and the next one is the uh, double tangent method. In the single tangent method we are drawing the tangent the last straight portion of the curve and in the uh, when if the curve is parallel to the x axis or the settlement axis and uh, or here settlement is the y axis. So, if it is parallel to basically uh, settlement axis. And in the double tangent if it is not parallel to the settlement axis now then we can draw a tangent on the initial state portion of the curve and the final state portion of the curve the, the load corresponding to the this intersection point will give me the ultimate load. So, in, in like the general shear failure here we cannot directly calculate the ultimate load because here there is no definite peak. Then the next type of failure is the uh, punching shear failure where which is uh, happen for the very loose sand or very soft clay. So, if you can see that here this is the poorly defined failure uh, shear plane basically this shear plane is, is very poorly defined. So, and the soil zone beyond the loaded area are being little affected. So, in the first one general shear failure soil zone beyond the loaded area is significantly affected. In the second case the soil zone beneath uh, the um, footing is significantly affected and outside the footing also slightly affected, but here the soil zone outside the footing is not affected it is. So, only the soil below, below the footing zone is significantly affected and significant penetration of the wedge, wedge shaped soil zone beneath the foundation. So, the penetration of the soil is significant below the foundation only and again like the previous uh, like the local shear failure the ultimate load cannot be clearly recognized. Here also you can see there is no definite peak like the general shear failure. So, here also we have to go for the double tangent method to determine 
the ultimate load there is no definite peak. So, these are the three types of failure and there is their characteristics. So, and depending upon uh, which type uh, which, type, which type of soil on uh, where we are designing our foundation. So, we have to consider that failure and we have to design accordingly and in that basis we have to apply the recommended design guidelines or the bearing capacity expressions. Now, the first bearing capacity expression was proposed by the Tazaki. So, this is the first bearing capacity expression. So, now we have to theoretically determine that what will be the ultimate load carrying capacity of the soil or the foundation. So, now we have C and phi two strength parameters. Now, how we will use them with the, with the help of this strength parameter, how we can calculate what would be the load carrying capacity of a foundation. So, first the bearing capacity theory was proposed by Tazaki and this theory was very simple and that is why still we are using this theory very, uh, and this theory has some assumptions. So, what are those assumptions? So, this is applicable for strip or a continuous footing. So, it is applicable for remember that the theory Tazak is bearing capacity theory that is originally developed is applicable for the strip footing resting on a homogeneous soil. It is not a layer soil, it is the homogeneous soil is the homogeneous and shear parameters are C and the phi. Now, this is analysis as it is applicable for the strip footing. So, it is a 2 D analysis ok plane strain analysis. So, this is the 2 D analysis and the soil fell in general shear failure mode. So, here the other another assumption is that soil fails in general shear failure mode. So, this theory is originally developed for general shear failure mode and load is vertical and concentric. So, that means load is vertical and it is acting on the center of the footing. So, these are the uh, assumptions of the Tazaki's bearing uh, capacity theory. Then the uh, more assumptions are that that the ground surface is horizontal, then base of the footing is on shallow depth. So, it is valid for if your depth of foundation is less than equal to the width of foundation. So, if it is greater than that, then the Tazaki's theory we cannot apply. So, now, the another uh, uh, assumption is that the here the soil above the base of the footing that will also give some resistance during the bearing capacity calculation. So, that resistance is not incorporated in the footing in the in this uh, theory. So, next then then what are the things it is uh, included how it is been done. So, then the Tazaki's bearing capacity theories is also based on a failure mechanism that is Tazaki is assumed. So, based on the your uh, observation. So, he has assume a uh, failure surface. So, this failure surface it looks like this. So, it has the three zones. Now, as I mentioned that it is not considering the resistance that is given by the soil above the base of the foundation. Because if you look at this failure uh, surface assumption that failure surface. So, this is the failure surface. This is the failure surface. Now, this failure surface is extended up to the base of the failure because the base of the footing because this is the footing base and this is the soil above the footing base and this is the ground surface. So, now the, if, uh, uh, the failure surface is extended up to the base of the footing only. So, the failure surface is not extended within the soil above the base of the footing. So, the contribution or the resistance provided by this soil is not incorporated in this theory. So, uh, that is one uh, assumption, but 
these things is incorporated indirectly. How it is been incorporated? Because the Tazaki has assumed that that this load, this soil above the base of the foundation which is acting as a surcharge at the base of the footing. So, how we calculate the surcharge? Surcharge is the Q and Q is the depth of the foundation and the unit weight of the soil. So, if the unit of the weight of the soil is gamma and depth of foundation is d f, then a surcharge q, uh, q is equal to gamma into d f will act at the base of the footing. And then there is three zone. So, let me let me explain what are these three zones. The first zone is called the this is the zone A B D. So, A B D this triangle is called is the this uh, which is static uh, state of elastic equilibrium. So, this zone means state of elastic equilibrium how it is in state of e elastic equilibrium because when you apply the load on a footing now the soil below, below the footing uh, this zone is attached with the base of the footing because of the friction or adhesion between the footing and the soil. So, when there is a because you if your footing is uh, rough then this there is a friction between the soil and the footing on if there is this is a C phi soil. So, there will be friction there will be adhesion. Now, what is the uh, uh, friction and what is the adhesion? So, that means if you it is a granular soil then there is a two phenomena occurs that the friction can occur between the grain to grain that means between the soil to soil. Now, if there is a friction between to soil to soil then it is then the angle is called the phi or the friction angle. Now, if there is a friction between soil to any other material like foundation because your foundation can be a concrete. So, that means here the friction between the concrete and the soil. So, in that way this friction is called as a delta. Okay? So, that means the phi is soil to soil and delta is soil to other material. So, now you can say that that delta is less than the phi in most of the common material that we are using. So, that means here your friction between soil to any other material and if it is the granular soil this is for the phi soil or the granular soil. Now, if it is a C soil then then also there is a then this is called the if it is the interaction between the soil clay particles and clay, clay particle and the clay particle then it is called cohesion. Now, if it is the interaction between clay particle clay to any other material then it is called the adhesion. So, now if it is C is equal to clay to clay and addition C A is called is between clay to other material. So, again this addition is equal to alpha into C, alpha is the addition factor. So, now the most of the material that we use the alpha is less than equal to 1. So, now if it is clay versus clay then alpha value is 1 and if it is to any other material and the clay then alpha alpha value and be less than equal to 1. So, that means here the foundation and the clay. So, that means if it is a C phi soil then there is a friction between the soil and the uh, foundation as well as addition between the soil and the foundation. So, because of this phenomena this zone zone 1 and the foundation they act intactly that means that means when you deform 
this uh, soil if we apply the load. So, this zone will deform because of they are attached with the soil because of adhesion and the friction. Then this zone will not deform laterally, they will deform in the downward direction. So, that is why it is in the state of elastic equilibrium. So, this OH A B D immediately beneath the footing is prevented for undergoing any lateral movement by the friction and the adhesion. So, this is the friction and the adhesion between the base of the footing and the soil. So, they will deform in the downward direction, but they will not deform in the lateral direction because they are in the state of elastic equilibrium because they have an interaction with the foundation and because of friction and the adhesion. Now, this is the zone 1. Now, in the zone 2, these when so this when we apply this uh, load, so this foundation and this zone 1 they deform in the downward direction. So, now they apply the, this the radially the other zone of this soil of this other zone they will deform in the radial direction. So, now this soil zone is not deforming in the radial direction, but the this soil zone is deforming in the radial direction because this thing is going in downward direction. This wedge and the foundation is going in the out downward direction. So, now so that is why there is a two zone one is the zone of radial shear zone 2, another is the passive Rankine passive zone. Zone 3 is the Rankine passive zone. Now, what is the why it is called the passive zone? So, uh, when I will discuss about the earth pressure theory. So, there I will discuss in detail what the earth pressure theory, but for this today's class. So, um, you just should know that there are three types of earth pressure. So, one is is the active earth pressure, one is earth pressure at rest, another is the passive earth pressure. Now, what is active earth pressure? Active earth pressure means if you have a wall say and this, this side is soil and this side is void. So, because of the soil pressure the wall can move. So, if it moves in this direction that means, if wall moves away from the soil, then it is called active. So, this is called active and if it is not moving, this is at rest. Now, if the wall is moving towards the soil, then it is called the passive. So, here we are talking about passive, how we are talk, why it is talking about the passive? Because here this is the soil, it is moving in this direction, it is moving in this direction because this side is soil. So, this is the passive, but it is not moving neither soil direction nor the opposite to the soil, uh, soil direction. So, why it is passive? Because here as I mentioned this A B D zone is not deformed laterally, it is so that means, it is in elastic uh, equilibrium stage. So, we are assuming, so this is as a wall or this is a, a imaginary wall. It is actually not a wall, it is an imaginary wall and this thing is moving towards the soil because this thing is moving. So, this is the soil and these are the wall. So, this is moving towards the soil. So, that means, if it is we assume it is a wall. So, like this if it is a wall it is moving towards the soil. So, it is also moving towards the soil. So, here a passive zone is developed. So, that is why it is a passive zone. So, the resistance that we are getting from this zone. Okay? So, this passive resistance. So, we are this that means, when we are applying this wall is moving from here this wall is moving from here to this direction. So, there will be a passive uh, zone is developed because this is the passive pressure. So, this passive zone will give you a passive pressure because when you are moving you are moving a wall towards the soil. So, soil will give you a resistance. So, here also there will be a passive resistance will be given. 
So, because of this passive, because it is passive zone, because it is moving towards the soil. So, now if you have two zones, so you can see these two zones have uh, this zone, uh, this zone is start from one, uh, it is start from the edge of the footing and the lower part is logarithmic spiral and th here this angle is taken as 45 degree phi minus phi by 2 because this is in the Rankine passive zone. And so, now another thing is that in this figure actually this is it start vertically from here. So, this when you start these things it vertically from here then it is propagate. So, here also it is vertical in, in this zone this point. So, this point it is starting vertically this point. So, this is these are the three zones. So, now and Tazaki also assume that angle of this wedge this angle is phi. So, both the angles of phi and this is a triangular wedge on where there is a there is a passive force is acting. Okay. So, now if I want to derive the expression for this uh, based on theory. So, now if I take this wedge only. Okay. So, if I take this wedge only, then what are the forces acting on this wedge? What are the forces acting on this wedge? So, as I mentioned that there is a passive force, P p is the passive force. So, P p is the sorry, P p is the passive force. So, this is acting. Now, this is acting as per this thing is that if you have a wall and then this P p acts with a angle of delta with this vertical. So, that means, this is the direction of the P p. Okay. Now, here as the wall is the, because this delta is the wall any other material to the soil as I have discussed. Now, this is acting at a if I draw this is the wall if I draw a vertical line delta uh, P p act as a angle of delta with the vertical line and but this wall is the imaginary wall. So, basically it is not a soil to any other material it is basically soil to soil. So, instead of delta it will be phi. Okay. So, here this instead of delta it will be phi. So, here also this is the, this is the wall, this is the your uh, perpendicular line. So, uh, it is acting uh, angle phi with this uh, perpendicular line, this is a perpendicular to this wall, this dotted line, this is acting with with the uh, with an angle phi. So, this P p is acting this side and the this side and then the another force is this Q u is the ultimate stress. So, that is acting on the base of the footing and then there is the addition acting between the wall and the soil. So, there is the addition is acting because any if this is a material any material. So, then if you put it in the soil if it is a C phi soil. So, there will be definitely addition and definitely the friction. So, that means the addition one addition will acting uh, act and there is a passive resistance that is also coming. So, that passive resistance will act with uh, angle phi and the weight of the wedge. So, this weight of the wedge is also acting in the downward direction. So, what are the forces are acting? This weight of the wedge is acting in downward direction, two passive resistance is acting two sides of this wedge and the addition is acting on the side of this wall and Q u is the ultimate load carrying capacity or stress. So, these are the stress that is acting on this wedge and then we have this we have to apply the limited equilibrium approach is applied and then once this uh, equation is solved and finally, we will get the ultimate load carrying capacity expression. So, in the next class I will discuss 
about how this equation is formed and then I will discuss how we will calculate the bearing capacity based on that equation. Thank you.